Oh, I think we are live. Oh, wait. Click here to start. Now we're going live. Okay. Okay, we are live. We are live. That's great. And so people are logging in now. The, no the notice goes out, Russell, to uh, maybe 10 or 15,000 of our subscribers. And I'm going to start the countdown clock uh, very soon. In fact, I'll yeah, share my screen. Five, five minutes before 10. Well, I have uh, here in Albuquerque, it's 11 minutes before 12. So we'll speak, we can just chat for about 10 minutes before we officially begin, Russell, and then everybody can stick, everybody can hear us right now. So everything we say will be piped over the internet, uh, but we'll officially begin in 10 minutes. That sounds fine. And by the way, you're getting a lot of birthday wishes coming in. People are wishing you a very happy birthday and are so happy to be here in the chat. I can see the chat screen coming in on YouTube. I've got another computer next to me. So people are saying happy belated 90th birthday and thank you for sharing your work with the world. People are joining from the Netherlands. It's always fun if people want to chat in. It's always fun to see where people are joining from. We get people from all over the world. I'm in St. Paul, Minnesota. Russell, where are you located? Where are you joining? I'm in Palo Alto, California, near San Francisco. I'm 30 miles south of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Palo Alto, home of Stanford University. Mm -hmm. I had the idea when I turned 90 that I could formally retire. I no longer required to do anything at all. I'm sort of... A, sort of paid my dues, and I get to play for the rest of the time, joining you. Well, we're so happy to have you join us today, and many of the viewers are saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah we. I don't know if we sent you a copy of the announcement that went out, Russell, but we told people to join us to help celebrate your birthday. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. I did not know that. Yeah. People are joining from Pennsylvania, Oregon, England, India, South Africa. And they're all wishing you a very happy birthday. Well, that's very generous. I'm happy to know that. Happy to receive their good wishes. Happy to manage. My vision is very poor, so I'm happy to have avoided car crashes and other things that could have killed me. Yeah. I'm 90, in pretty good health, able to look for the next adventure. Maybe we can, maybe we can learn to understand how precognition works. Wow. See, we have no doubt about precognition because I did experiments with a famous psychic where week after week he would forecast where the silver prices were going to go up or go down and we worked with a broker who had managed that for us and we made a quarter million dollars trading silver completely psychically where he had to describe what i was going to put in his hand the following for we did the experiment sitting at my kitchen table on monday so here we are uh, the market's going to describe what I put in your hand next Friday. Can you tell me what it feels like? What surprise the image comes to view? And he was able to do that successfully nine times in a row. We were in the Wall Street, front page of the Wall Street Journal and in New York Times. So for a, a, a few weeks after that, ESP really started to exist again. We did get, we got a lot of publicity for that trick. And there are now many, many people using ESP of various kinds to forecast sporting events, which is actually easier to forecast than the market change. Why do you think that's the case? Well, the market change is an analytical thing that is, you can't really read the big board on the commodity market in New York. 
be nice, nice if I could say we take read the come out, read the big board. Nobody can do that. But what you can do is say, uh, I'm gonna hand you a little object, depending where the market goes up. Mm -hmm. If it goes up a little, up a lot, down a little, down a lot. I got four objects the broker has. I don't know what they are, of course. So the broker is going to choose an object depending on what the market goes. If the market goes down a lot, he'll show me one object. If it goes up a lot, he'll show me something else. And whatever he, whatever the market does, I will then put that object in your hand. So no, no one can know by analysis what I'm going to put in your hand the market has to close on Friday, and the market close on Friday determines what I put in your hand. And we did that perfectly for nine weeks. So I absolutely cannot doubt that precognition works and can work quite well. But didn't you just say that you thought horse racing was easier to do than uh, market forecasts? Sports, not horse racing. Okay. That is, people like to say, who's going to win in the baseball game to win the World Series of the Yankees or the Dodgers? And they have different, you can say, say the, the Dodgers' favorite color is blue and the Yankees' favorite color is red. So people say, "Well, tell me, tell me about the the colors that are associated with the winning team. What what comes to view?" Hmm. So you you can't say just who's going to win the Yankees or the Dodgers, because that that's an analytical task. I would never, I would never ask a person a thing like that, because that's purely analytical. I'm going to have to say who what what color is associated with the winning team. When when you look at the celebration, what colors come to view? And that that's 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 possible, but mm -hmm. you can't you can't read the banner. But is that easier to do than to to say you tell me the object I'm going to place in your hand next week? I. Th I haven't done that particular thing. A lot of people do it, and I think that it's easier because although you don't have an object in your hand, thousands of people are on the screen cheering. Mm -hmm. So you got thousands of Dodger fans are on the screen cheering that the Dodgers won the game, and they're and the person conducting the experiment has to make a visual association with that uh -huh. uh, you, you don't you can't say you still can't say who won the game the dodgers or the yankees because that's an analytical task which doesn't mean anything to the right hemisphere you have to you have to say you can make it make a situation you can make a situation like mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put an object in your hand if the Dodgers win a different object if the Yankees win. Uh that's called associative remote viewing. And Stephen Schwartz was the first person to do that. He he invented the idea of associative remote viewing. So you got the World Series coming up and someone else has organized it so that uh I will have one object to give you if the Dodgers win, one object if the Yankees win. Uh, it's not known, of course, who's going to win, and I don't know anything. It's important for me not to know what the object, but I want to interview the person about what you're experiencing, and, and I mustn't have the feeling that a teddy bear for the Dodgers and a stopwatch for the Giants, yeah. and that would, that would be very... Very bad for me to know. In, in fact, uh, the interviewer m must not know anything about the targets. It always requires a, a third person. Um, 
to choose the targets. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We call it associated remote viewing because you can't the uh, the psychic person in general in general cannot read letters or numbers, but but if you make a association privately, so you've decided that if the Dodgers win, I'll show you a alarm clock. If the if the Dodgers win, I'll show you a water bottle. Uh, the person then has something uh, experiential to hang on to. You're looking forward, what are they going to put by hand? Chuck Honerton did experiments like that described in his Dream Telepathy book. Uh, he would put someone to sleep and then wake him up when his REM brain waves showed that he was having a REM dream. And they would wake him up and say, we know you're dreaming now. Tell, tell us about what you're dreaming. And we would arrange it, not we, Chuck would arrange it so that when the guy woke up, they would randomly choose a card from a big card file and they might get a card that said, uh, pour ice water over his head or put blue fans in his face. And that experiment was done, uh, two groups of experiments were published like that very significantly, where the with a well-known uh, English psychic, whose name escapes me right now. Malcolm Besant. Good for you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Mal Malcolm Belson was a very successful psychic who was able to describe um, in, in his dream. They would wake him up and say, what are you going to experience? What's your dream about? And he could say, gee, it's freezing cold. I see something like a blue fan. And then he would go back to sleep and when he woke up, they would randomly choose something from a big file that no one knew. See, no one knew the answer. But when he woke up, the lab technician would go through the big file box, pull out a card randomly. And they say, this is a card that says, put his feet in ice water. And that's described... That whole series is described in a book by Stan Krippner uh, called uh, Dream Telepathy. Dream Telepathy. Yeah. Yeah. Co authored by Alan Vaughn and Montague Ullman. Well, and, Russell, and I, I, I republished that mm -hmm. with, with Hampton Rhodes. I, I, republished, I republished a group of a dozen psychic books that are hard, either hard to find or out of print and that was one of them yeah you have an amazing series the russell targ editions by by hampton Rhodes. i want to welcome our viewers now we are live uh, i'm here with my co-host emmy vadness and russell targ who celebrated his 90th birthday just 11 days ago Happy birthday. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was very uh, pleased to be able to join you in Palo Alto for your birthday party, Russell. And I'm I was even, happy you could be at my house with all my friends. Yeah. And, and I'm so delighted to be able to share your birthday with the New Thinking Aloud audience. And maybe for starters... Uh, you could say something about what is it, how does it feel to turn 90 after such a long career in parapsychology? Well, the feeling I had is one of relief. That is, I'm, I, I was always semi-retired for a number. In fact, I, I almost never, I almost in my life almost never had a boss. In, in my life, I would always be the one who would think of something new to do and go to the government or go to a university, and they would give us money to do my project. And that was true when I was doing laser physics and doing ESP. 
So during my life, I was always, I, I was never the smartest guy in the room, but I always had good ideas for new things to do. So if I would go to the government I, for a psychic thing, I was able to quickly convince Werner von Braun to support a program. I was doing laser stuff at this time, but I went, was invited to a conference on speculative technology that NASA held. And I just ran into Werner von Braun and showed him my ESP teaching machine, which is a four choice game. And he did super well on that. And I said, well, I'm interested in getting money from NASA to teach astronauts how to be in touch with the spacecraft to avoid crashes or accidents like you had in Apollo 13 where the oxygen tank blew up. If you knew in advance, you could have saved that accident. He said, I understand that I've been interested in psychic things. I used to do psychic things with my grandmother. So nobody knew that Werner Brown, Brown was a closet psychic. So he then took me to the director of NASA, Jim Fletcher, and said, Targ wants to teach astronauts how to be in touch with their spacecraft. Now, people have said to me, how the hell did you make that up on the spot? Where did, where did that come from? And I said, I just had to make up something that corresponded to what NASA might do. It's, it's like uh, Isaac Asimov's famous book on foundation with a semantist that said, you, nothing has to be true, it's just, just to sound true. So that, that was a, that's a good algorithm for getting money. So I never really had a boss uh, in my career. So I always sort of invented what I was going to be doing. But now I'm really freed of having to do anything. You can just do things that are fun, like being on the inter internet with Jeffrey. <laughs> I guess the, the answer to your question is, turning 90 is very freeing. When we were just getting started here with the countdown clock, you said something to the effect of now that I'm 90, I can explore how does how precognition may work. And since I'm with two leading parapsychologists, I just want to throw out to maybe even both of you, how do you think precognition may work? Or what are your hypotheses on that? Well, I think the 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 answer is not known right now, mm -hmm. but I worked with a theoretical physicist, Elizabeth Rauscher, who was a professor at Berkeley, and we were both interested in the idea of a complex space time that Herman Minkowski created in the nineteen twenties. Minkowski helped Einstein create the equations for special relativity. Einstein had the right idea, but he couldn't solve the equations mm. because what he didn't realize is that you had to include time in the equation. The, the equation for everything that was going on involved uh, four spatial, four dimensions three spatial dimensions, a time dimension. So Minkowski is the first person to talk about uh, a four-dimensional space-time, and he also talked about complex space-time. That is, the idea that we have three space dimensions and a time dimension, and each of those has a complex aspect. So we're, we're not inventing a new dimension. Uh, he he thought of that as a complex eight space that is your, your regular four dimensional stuff, but each of those dimensions has a complex component, and the result of that is that the universe we li we live in will always have a path from you to me through space time, and the path will be no distance. That is the x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus 
the four complex dimensions can add to zero. So if you, that, that's, that's enough. That is the, the idea that if you live in a complex space-time as we do, then there will always be a path through that space-time where all the dimensions, including the complex one, x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus the complex imaginary ones can add to zero. And I, so, so what I believe is how, how you see into the future is you find a path from your waking mind to your sleeping mind. You can say, one way to say that is your waking mind is, it, your waking brain is entangled with your sleeping brain. And the idea of things being entangled is now completely kosher because three Nobel, three physicists won a Nobel Prize last year for the idea of entanglement over distances. You can entangle, you can entangle photons or electrons, and then they go spinning off into the universe. And even though they're millions of miles away, if you grab one of them, the other one no notices that his twin has been grabbed. So the idea of an entanglement of things that are separated by space and time is uh, a current idea. David Bohm talked about quantum interconnectedness, and Einstein talked about the spooky connection at a distance in 1934, the year I was born. Mm -hmm. The year I was born, Einstein was already talking about the idea that the mysterious aspect of quantum mechanics that allows things or particles that are born together stay together, even though they're separated. Yeah. So this is an idea that people have been thinking about for a long time. Of course, Einstein brought that idea up because he said, this is so absurd. It means that quantum physics can't be right. And then, and then John Stuart Bell was worried about that in the 1960s. That is, he was aware of Einstein's equations. Einstein pointed out that the equations of quantum mechanics do indeed say that things that are separated can be entangled. And it was John Stuart Bell found the equation, created the equations uh, that show that it's not a mystery that you expect entanglement to be occur to occur. And he did that in 1960. Then in 1972, John Clauser at, Ber at Berkeley, and I visited Clauser at that time, and he had, he had a laser system where particles were entangled in a in an oven, they came out, some of them were entangled, and the ones that came out simultaneously, just, you collect two, are, two, po two photons that are born together, and you send them to different places, and if you grab one, the other one uh, notices that. And he was, he was one of the three guys who got a Nobel Prize, and I remember Clauser because I visited his lab. So he was the first one in 1972 to talk about entanglement. Uh, but nobody believed him because he was sort of put together with a, the was a thesis for um, Fried Friedman, whose name first name I can't remember, with a PhD th dissertation for his student. And it was sort of ragtag experiment, so they was other people repeated that, and the three of them got a Nobel Prize. Yeah, Russell, we have a question here from a viewer whose YouTube name is Ardances, who asks if children were taught how to use remote viewing or sight abilities in school, what kind of impact would this have in society? 
Well, knowing that you can see into the distance or see hidden things is really empowering. I mentioned earlier that my, uh, even before this program, I was very interested in the psychic stuff. And see, and uh, so er early on with my daughter Elizabeth, I would ask her to describe what was in the box for her birthday presents. So she grew up uh, doing that, and she became a psychiatrist. And her recent, her last paper was about distant healing, where she had AIDS patients. She had sixty AIDS patients at uh, University of California at the hospital. And for half of them, she got healers all over the country. Some some were Christians who would pray for them. Some were energy healers. There are all kinds of distant healers. And it turned out the 30 patients who had people praying for them or sending them energy had statistically significant better outcomes than the people for whom no prayers were said. So that was a published paper in the, in the Western Medical Journal. So that was a result of, there was no doubt that was a result of my teaching her to see what's in the box when she was a little child. The, the psychic stuff was part of her introduction to science. And we've even done an interview about how subsequent to her unfortunate death many years ago, there have been a number of communications that have uh, come from Elizabeth to, to many different individuals. Yeah, that's true. She is a, since, since her death, she has appeared to a number of different people, not, not including me, but she has come forth with all sorts of interesting personal revelations uh, that nobody could, nobody could know but her or me. As she would talk, she brought information about childhood experiences, which she told people about, and then they would come to me and say, Elizabeth said so-and-so occurred, and I would say, yes, when she was a child, that exact thing happened. And I, think, actually... and I think you referred to that in your winning essay. Yes, I did. But I think we may have had a, 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 an experience of Elizabeth manifesting herself just a couple of days ago when Emmy and I were uh, working on a description of uh, the new book that we have out for you. Uh, there it is, Russell Targ, 90 Years of ESP Remote Viewing and Timeless Awareness. Uh, it's now available on Amazon. And I also want to mention your other uh, book, Russell, uh, Third Eye Spies, which was recently published uh, among your many books. I think if we added them all up, there would be well over a dozen. Yeah, Third Eye Spies looks something like this. Mm -hmm. This a slim volume, it has a lot of data. And, and it's also a documentary film, right? Yeah, we we I made a two hour film called Third Eye Spies. Mm -hmm. The book is useful. There's a lot of Ingo Swan's instructions on how to get into your psychic awareness. So we give little little ideas of how to, how to do an experiment to that would be conducive to working with a partner. It would make it conducive to develop or manifesting psychic abilities. So Jeff and I were working on your press release of your latest book, and you were starting to tell the story, Jeff, of what happened. And I'm just sharing my screen, showing people, I don't know if the moderators can grab the link uh, in the shared document and put it in the chat. And we can also put it in the description of the press release for you, Russell, that went out a few days ago. Yeah, that's very clear. I see that now. I didn't know anything about it. But we yeah. were working on the press release and we wanted to include, make sure it included all the topics that were in the book, which includes 15 of 
my interviews with you. And as we were doing this, we were on Zoom, just like this with me in Albuquerque and Emmy in St. Paul, and a voice came out of nowhere in my room. Mm -hmm. And Emmy heard it as well. It was a female voice. And uh, it just said something like, ahem. And at that moment, I noticed that we hadn't yet made any mention about uh, our interview concerning your daughter, Elizabeth, and her afterlife communications. So uh, it dawned on me uh, that perhaps that was Elizabeth, that she's still active on the other side and aware of uh, what we're doing here. Well, I can believe that because she was a powerful force for get, getting um, psychic, getting healing introduced into her hospital and getting her papers published. Mm -hmm. And then so after that meeting that Jeff and I had, I had a session with a client who was sharing, who had recently lost a parent and was sharing about how they would watch together your interviews, Russell, on New Thinking Aloud, talking about your communications with your daughter, Elizabeth Targ. And that, I, I work with a lot of clients and, the, and that has never happened before where someone mentioned that they viewed those or mentioned your name or your daughter's name. So I took that as, as a form of a synchronicity and maybe a validation of her communication. Well, she was a po powerful force that I'm, pre I would, I'm prepared to believe that she really could, man if anyone can manifest from the other side, uh, she would be a uh, candidate. For example, uh, we don't, no one knows the location. We, a physicist likes to know, well, if you've seen something interesting, where was it? And you say, well, she appeared on my screen, but where but where do you think that the deceased person is? Do they have a location? Or are they free-floating in psychic space? That you can believe that um, complex space-time has room for a spiritual dimension. The person, person can reside in a whole world of complex space-time. It's mm -hmm. interesting. Blavatsky sort of comes back to me now. I never, never thought of that before. Blavatsky, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, was the founder of the Theosophical Society, which is interested in understanding the nature and capabilities of human beings. Was not was not a not a particularly for, formal religious interest. Blavatsky was a powerful psychic, very interested in understanding how ESP works. Mm -hmm. And she talked about um, and I. I she she talked about something called the eighth sphere. This is an eight dimensional sphere, and she was talking about that in the early nineteen hundreds. As the eight dimensional sphere uh, existed in the universe, and when people died, they could participate in that. See, I haven't read about that for 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 fifty years. Maybe Jeffrey remember. There's no doubt that Blavatsky talked about a eight-dimensional blue sphere. The blue sphere is definitely part of theosophical teachings. But I hadn't thought about it or read about it for many years. When I first joined the Theosophical Society, uh, they showed me data on what they called occult chemistry, where Annie Besant and uh, Charles Leadbeater were given the task by Blavatsky uh, to look at a piece of paraffin, a block of paraffin, and see what the atoms in there look like. Can you look into the block of paraffin? Because somebody knew 
that paraffin was made only of carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms, and principally hydrogen atoms. The hydro, it's like uh, C, like H fifty C three, so the fifty times more hydrogen, more hydrogen atoms and carbon. And that's what paraffin is made of. Somebody knew that, but Blavet, uh, but. Annie Besant and Charles Ludmeter were able to look into a block of hydro, block of paraffin psychically and describe the structure. The structure they described was a triangle, triangular particle, which was a fundamental matter, fundamental uh, element, and there was a block. A the triangle with a ball at each end, and the three balls were held together by a band of energy, and that's what the, and they put that's what they published in eighteen ninety five in Occult Chemistry, which I have. I have the original copy, which I have photographed from the library, and forty years later, physicists decided that the fundamental structure. Protons were uh, made, which are now called quarks. Quarks are triangular particles held together by gluons. So, my, my long story is that if you look at, go to the internet and say, well, what do quarks look like? Quarks look like triangular elements with balls at the corner held together by gluons. And the triangular things are called quarks, and the bands of energy are called gluons, and that's the heart of modern physics. And Annie Besson and Joel Ludbeter described that in 1895. Hmm. So, and it's the idea that uh, Helena Blavatsky was such an advanced thinker in addition to be a psychic. She had the idea that modern physics has now described, invented something called the, uh, what, what, what are the chart with all the particles? Uh, periodic table. The periodic table. Science invented the periodic table and she once said there must be a psychical periodic table. I, I want to see what all the atoms look like. So it really requires a very advanced mind to think to even think that you could do such a thing. And her two great psychics, Charles Ledbeater and Annie Besson, did that. And uh, in a couple of places, I've published the drawings from the uh, from occult chemistry in 1895, and I show this together with the current view um, at this time. I, I think that uh, the ideas were first first invented in. 19, 1935 by um, physicists at, came, at uh, Princeton. Thank you for bringing all of the science and showing the, the psychic abilities connected with that. For those who maybe aren't as familiar with your background, Russell, could you share, we've got a question here from uh, and ends ass uh, i'm not sure how you pronounce this pronounce this name here but they say happy birthday to you thank you for sharing your work why did you start doing it and when and i know we had a little conversation before about how you were you had uh, many people who were sharing information with you when you were younger and you were exploring magic as well stage magic and then it seemed to blend into and expand in other directions i i can answer that question jeffrey is my description of the gluons and quarks understandable? Did I 
describe that coherently? Well, you started out by talking about the eight-dimensional space and uh, looking at the paraffin atom, and then it sort of jumped into gluons and, and quarks. Uh, so it might have, uh, I don't know if if there was a, a leap in there, or, or or not, Russell, but it was all very fascinating. Well, there's no doubt that the uh, eight-dimensional sphere is part of the early theosophy um, in the 18, late 1800s, and it sounds a lot like the eight... I mean, she definitely had an eight-dimensional sphere that, that deceives people in habit, and it sounds a lot like the eight space that Elizabeth Rauscher and I talked about as the the nature of the universe. Right. That's that's a crucial point. I'm glad we didn't overlook that. And then and then uh, Blavatsky uh, noticed that there was a periodic table developed in physics, and she she had the idea of getting a block of paraffin. I don't know how she made that choice, but she got her two great psychics, Annie Besant and Joe Ludbeter, to look for atoms in the block of paraffin, which they successfully did. So Blavatsky was a very remarkable... You, you asked me, what do, you, what do you do if you have psychic abilities? Why, why, why would you do that? Well, Blavatsky had prodigious psychic abilities, and she would just think of incredible things to do, like l looking at the paraffin to get the nature of the fundamental particles, and that her people did exactly that. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so it's important to know that this isn't some airy-fairy thing. And Annie Besson actually drew the triangular shape of quarks and gluons in 1895, and it wasn't until Gilman Murray Gilman in Princeton uh, created the idea of, of Clark quarks, which exactly, the reason it's important is that the accepted view of quarks today exactly matches what Annie Besson drew in, in aquachemistry 19, 40 years before. And, and with regard to the question of how you got started in this field, you were exposed to theosophy uh, long before, I believe, you you began your work in parapsychology. That's right. I, when I graduated, I left Columbia University to work on lasers. That was a good, good choice because many people go to Columbia Graduate School and don't graduate because if if you're if you're not headed for a Nobel Prize, the teachers aren't really interested in you. So the and I wasn't prepared for that. I went to Queens College where I did very well, but uh, Columbia University was a different kettle of fish than I had ever been exposed to. The anyway enough. So, so I left Columbia after two years. And because I, I got an invitation from Gordon Gould to help work on the very first lasers. But I had been, as a, as a child, as an eight-year-old, I used to play cards with my mother, I played gin rummy with her, and I often knew in advance what the hidden cards were. And that was true even when I played competitive contract bridge, where you're playing against other people I would frequently uh, make some bid describing my hand, which didn't describe my hand at all. I just made that up. I thought that would be a good bid, and that would cause us to to win to win a round. And the com my opponents would complain to the tournament director, "Do these guys have a secret code that they're using?" Because you see, if I make up a bid. That causes everybody else to be screwed up, not know what to do. So my partner, uh, Gary, Gary Feinberg, who became uh, head of the physics department at Columbia, 
he would say, yeah, yeah, I don't, we don't have a partner. I never know what the hell Targ is going to do. But he just bids what he feels like. But we definitely have no no secret, no no secret partner. <laughs> we had no secret system for bidding. But I would frequently bid what I think will give us the best score. So by anyway, if people don't know who play bridge will understand. I might bid something with with spades, but I don't have any spades, and that would very confuse the other two people who have all the spades. How can this guy enter the bidding with spades? What what could he have? Because I thought I had all the spades. Anyway, it was very very much fun. So I did that as twenty year old. I I would bring bring my psychic intuition into formal. Competi bridge competition, but it was my introduction. I mentioned Robert Rosenthal brought ESP cards into my early biology class. I was thirteen years old, and I understood what that was all about. What he described that I would then go to the American Society for Psychical Research in Central Park West. So I just got on the subway and we go from Queens to the Upper West Side. And then I met all the friendly women who were happy to see a uh, big, tall, nearsighted guy who was interested in ESP. So they gave me published publications of that society and uh, a book by J.B. Ryan describing what he was doing at Duke University. How well, old were you then? I was thirteen. Uh, I, I, the, we moved to Cleveland. We moved from Cleveland to New York when we were, I was twelve. So as a twelve-year-old, I had the run of New York City. Could go anywhere for a nickel on the subway. So I frequently would go to Hubert's Museum on Forty Second Street, where they had uh, a regular magic show. People do magic on a card table in the basement of that building. And nearsighted a guy like me could walk right up to the table and nose to nose with the magician and watch him do ma ma disappear the balls or read the cards. So I got very... And then I could go upstairs and buy that trick from Holden's or D. Robbins Magic Store, re Retail Magicians, they would show me the trick over the counter. Uh, if I thought it was good enough, I could just buy it. I could buy the trick and that fold that into my magical repertoire. So I, w I was doing pretty good stage magic, small small stage magic, and no no big illusions. I did see Blackstone at that time, who was able to. Have a woman stand on stage and then drop a bunch of inner tubes over her head, and then saw the inner pass a blade through the inner tubes, and the girl was gone. I had to, I didn't do any tricks like that, <laughs> but I was happy to sit up close and watch Blackstone do that on the stage. Here's and a question. Oh, go ahead, oh, Emmy. I was just going to ask Russell, could you share then how you got into? Uh, the remote viewing field. How did you expand from stage magic? Just and we have a lot of questions coming, and I, I I get the sense that that people would love to. Uh, we we I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them, but I just want to let you know there are a lot of questions coming in. So how did you go from stage magic to quote real magic? Well, I I knew there was real magic because I had the experience of real magic, uh, which got me on stage when I, I was doing some fake magical trick and I would be able to fold in some other view that came to me and other magicians have had similar experiences. They talk to Melbourne, Christopher and Crest Creston. Crest yeah, Chris Creston. Okay. What what is the who who I who I met, and we've corresponded, 
And they they agreed that uh, ESP sometimes creeps into their magic and they have to fold it into their activities on stage. So I, was, I had done laser work for about 15 years and I decided that it was time for me to trade my lasers in for looking at how, how ESP works. So I, I mentioned earlier that I had this interaction with Werner von Braun where I told him I wanted to teach astronauts how to be psychic and prevent accidents that they had on Apollo 13 where that almost crashed. And he let me do that. Uh, Ingo Swan, the great psychic, invented uh, remote viewing. So I started the program. I, our, our first money was from NASA for the this uh, ESP capability. What I'm looking for is my phone. And I, I won't even do that. But you uh, have an I, app who can I, get it for free. Say again? You you were going to show the app I think you designed. Yeah. It's an ESP testing and training app based on the original machine that you built that you showed to Werner von Braun back in 1972 or so. Yeah, here, here it is. Yeah. I can get the glare off. What is the name of the app? ESP Trainer. ESP Trainer. So the people can, can go to the app store and download it. it. I'm sorry to say, for many years, I gave this game away. And then one of the things I learned about retiring is that pe thousands of people were playing this game and uh, I was receiving no money at all. So I, I, I used to say that a good, Bud a good Buddhist doesn't charge for gift teaching the Dharma, but I've given that away long enough, so now I, now I do charge for that game. You can look at it and see what see what else is i have another game very another fortress game called Star, stargate teaching which uses outdoor targets instead of playing squares in our remote viewing we would never use something like squares we would say the guy is hiding somewhere and he'd be in a church or a seashore or some interesting place and you have to describe where he's hiding. So I created a new game where all the targets are beautiful outdoor scenes. And I'm trying to get somebody to do a formal experiment and see if in a game form, people do better seeing beautiful outdoor scenes than squares. Because I had just read uh, Carl Jung's book on synchronicity. And he criticized Ryan, J.B. Ryan, for using his famous ESP cards, a square, circle, star, cross, and so forth, because he said the psychic ability is a natural ability. It wants to be outdoors. Don't use your silly cards. So that gave me the idea, instead of using my four colors, which I'd been using, I should use hundreds of outdoor scenes you never know what's going to be there but you can choose whether it's going to be a haystack or a waterfall or and anyway that so i, I created that esp game mm -hmm. and i had that esp game before i was the i i knew you could teach people with feedback and reinforcement years before i started the program at sri so the, the, the ESP teaching machine, um, I think I published in 1965. And the, I went to talk to NASA, to NASA and Bob Brown in 1972. So I had the ESP game already in a box, electric electronic box to bring to NASA um, before the, the program. And for those who may not be familiar with the term remote viewing, it's a using our own innate abilities to tap into information that 
some may consider beyond the physical or material world. And remote viewing has a certain protocol and there are different types of remote viewing as well. Is there a type that you have gravitated toward over the years? Well, the, the, the experiment that worked extremely well for us was suggested to us by Ingo Swan. Ingo invented the name remote viewing and he got us away from cards and objects. He said, why don't you just hide someplace in the Bay Area and I'll tell, tell you what it looks like. So Ingo was the person who invented the idea of what to do. He said, Obje he said, objects in the laboratory are boring. Go outside and find some attractive place. And that's exactly what uh, Jung said in his book uh, on synchronicity. So the idea, remote, view remote viewing is the ability that we all have to quiet your mind and then describe and experience what's going on at a distant place or a distant time. Mm -hmm. that, that's remote viewing in a nutshell. You, it's the ability we all have to quiet your mind and describe what's going on in a distant place mm -hmm. or a distant time. So what I've been doing lately is looking at this distant time part because I occasionally have very sharp dreams, which are not anxiety dreams or wish fulfillment dreams, but sort of uh, sharp and out of the ordinary, which I can recognize as a potentially precognitive dream, and then I'll follow up on that. And it's, I have no doubt at all that dream, dreams at night are caused by an experience you have the following day. So the thing that I've learned in the past year is that without doubt, uh, things that are experienced by your waking mind are the cause of the dream that you have at an earlier time. That is, uh, there's no doubt that the future can affect the past. You can't, you can't change the past. But the future, but the past can be caused by something that happened. The Jung was driving, was taking a train across France at one point, and he suddenly had the vision that the whole thing was, whole field was covered with blood and dead bodies. Mm -hmm. And this was several years before uh, World War I. That would be an example of backward causality. Uh, that would be an example of precognition. The dead bodies in the field. See, I'm not sure whether it's World War I or World War II. You'd have to figure that out from how old Jung was. But he was taking a train across France, without a doubt, and he saw all these bodies. And both in World War I and World War II, that those fields of France were indeed covered with bodies. So he definitely had a precognitive view. And I can't remember at what time that was. I think you could do, do, take the homework assignment. Well, to jump around a bit, I've got a question from a viewer whose YouTube name is Action Comes. And he says, as a near legally blind person, how did you avoid incidents while riding your skate, your bicycle, and your bike? I think he means your motor scooter. And is it possible to transmit that type of awareness? Yeah, that's a good question. I rode my motor. I got my first license to ride a motorized vehicle in England where they don't make you read a chart. But they ask you, they give you a card to fill out. And one of the questions in the card is, can you read a license plate at uh, 50 meters? And I misread the card. And I thought it was at 50 feet. And I said, yes, I could probably read a, a license plate at 50 feet, maybe. So I said, yes, I can do that. And I got a license for a little 
moped in England. I rode all over England from London to Cambridge to Land's End, rode all over, all over England because I was an experienced bi bicycle rider. And, and they eventually, uh, I was able to get a lot of bicycle. I would ride, I lived in Greenwich Village and I would ride my bike up Broadway to Columbia. It was like five miles riding in the New York traffic up Broadway. So I was a very experienced bicycle rider. So when I got to back to America, I was able to show them my English driving license and say, yes, I, I can't do I can't pass your test. Uh, but I did ride in England for many years and here's my license. Why don't you give me a license for a, a little moped so I can put a, you do that. And they, there's another case of, uh, doesn't have to be true, but it seemed true. I presented my driving license. That was a good enough argument that I could see what I'm doing, even though I don't see very well. Now, the interesting question is that I rode my bike for 35 years through traffic in Silicon Valley and had only one accident where I was run into somebody who went through a stop sign. But I, other, other than that, I had uh, no accidents in 35 years. And I th I wouldn't necessarily attribute it to psychic awareness, though that's out there. I think that as a um, handicapped person, I learned to do things with a lot of vigilance, paying really a struck a strong attention to what was happening. And I didn't I didn't ride on the freeway; I just rode on regular city streets. Uh, and I was able to do that successfully. V vigilance is an important part that I really paid attention when I was driving. I, I couldn't, I can't read license plates, but I can see big things like cars and trucks. And I avoided them. You don't think it's the same... ESP ability that uh, was helpful to you when you were an amateur magician? I wouldn't be surprised. That is, uh, I did have instances where I saw, where I imagined something in my path that I was, uh, I, 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 I was riding down one of the um, parkway and I had, uh, thought what would happen if there was uh, a board in the road if i if i went oh if i hit the board in the road at full speed it would knock me off my bike so i pulled over the side of the road and i was going very slowly i came around the curve and there was a two by four lying as part of a construction site was lying in my in the slow lane on the wasn't the freeway it was a uh but it was Parkway, it was heavy traffic. So they were uh, hit the board slowly and bounce over it and not crash. But my activity in that case was definitely caused by a precognition of an accident that I didn't have. Well, we are grateful that you are here with us and have been safe all these years. We have a question from one of our fabulous volunteers, Pablo Geralda, who is helping as a moderator in the chat today. And he asks, the argument I always hear when I discuss remote viewing with friends is why remote viewers are not millionaires, although he's assuming that there are remote <laughs> viewers who are not millionaires, um, by forecasting the stock market and so forth. Can you comment on that? And he's also wondering, what is the best way to quiet the mind? Well, there are many books on how to quiet your mind. That is, all, all of Buddha's teachings begins with quiet your, quieting your mind and be sitting there in a quiet, comfortable place and paying attention to your breathing. So if you focus entirely on your breathing, uh, it blots out anything that can be happening as noise in your mind. 
and then after a while you you feel you know that you by concentrating on your breathing you get an experience of quietness and after a while you don't have to concentrate on your breathing anymore you just sit quietly mm -hmm. now why why aren't they all millionaires uh the experiment that I did, I described earlier, we were focusing uh, on the silver market in the future. That worked perfectly for us. And there's no errors. So that's as close to a physics experiment as you can get. Uh, so I think that if you try some simple experiment done very carefully where the 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 interviewer doesn't know what the targets are, and you forecast the future using this a scheme called associated remote viewing. That is, you ha you may you choose little ob somebody chooses little objects corresponding to states in the market up to, up a lot up a little down a lot down a little. They get four objects, maybe chosen by the broker. And you describe something. For example, let me just say again how that works. Let, let's say we want to know what the market is doing. And I sit with my psychic and I say, I'm going to put, we don't, we never talk about the market. So on Monday morning, I'm talking with my psychic at my kitchen table. So here we are at a quiet time. I'm going to put some interesting thing in your hand this Friday. And then he describes something. So he may say, uh, I see something round and floppy. It's got a funny smell. It's kind of disgusting. But what I get is this round, floppy object. And I would say, that's a terrific description. I, it's not something one would expect. And I can describe this to the broker. You can go now. And I'll see you on Friday and put something in your hand like a round floppy object with a funny smell. See you later. And then call the broker and say, well, I have a pretty good description here. Uh, my viewer is talking about a round flop, floppy object with a funny smell. What are your targets? They say, well, I've got this jar of flowers, I've got a Bible, I got a flashlight, and I got my leftover pancake from breakfast. And we agreed there were four objects, probably what he was describing as a leftover pancake. And I say, well, what does that correspond to? And he said, that's, that corresponds to the state of the market, which we're calling down a lot. So based on the fact that my psychic, Keith Arari, this experience of pancake, we would sell $35,000 worth of silver into a rising market and make a lot of money because the market did fall just as we forecast. So Ferrari expected, experienced the floppy pancake that corresponded to down a lot among the four objects the broker held. And, and we sold silver. That's the way we. That's the way we did our experiment, and many other people are doing that. <clears throat> but I would. Re I'm not doing. <clears throat> what I described is exactly how the experiment worked. It takes a lot of concentration, uh, to not screw up the experiment. There are a lot of ways to screw that up. For example, the interviewer, and the viewer, can't know anything about the possible targets. Nothing. Uh, the broker chooses them uh, to also to not have anything to do with the market. He wouldn't, he wouldn't say uh, that the lighted candle means up a lot and the pancake means down a lot. He wouldn't choose. You don't try and choose objects that are symbolic representations of the market. You try and choose four objects that are very different from each other so that when your viewer gives you a fairly diffuse 
remote viewing picture of a target, you're able to still separate out his his manifestation from what the real target is. And that is not hard to do. Well, the question is then why aren't more remote viewers millionaires? Because they don't have the confidence to put a lot of money into the market based on a cheese sandwich versus a well, stopwatch. <laughs> <laughs> The, we went into we we went into that market. Ex, uh, we we would frequently bet thirty forty thousand dollars in the silver market, which is putting in real money, because we were quite confident that because we had, we had done a lot of these outdoor remote viewing. Where where is the guy hiding? And and Harari was very good at that. <clears throat> There's no doubt. That, and we did three trials in advance in the gold market, and he did excellently with that. So when we went into <clears throat> uh, this experiment, we were pretty confident uh, that we were going to win because we had we we felt that we were under control. So confidence helps quite a bit. Yeah, it's you know, it's it's really essential because it allows you to quiet your mind and feel quietly confident uh, that it's going to be true. For example, my 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 gig is with the dreams of the future. Is I I don't write down my dreams. Unfortunately, I do not write down my dreams. So my uh, algorithm is the dream has to be a damn clear dream, not a wish fulfillment dream, not not an anxiety dream. If I dream about failing a math test for which I did not study, that would not be precognition. It'd be just what you expect. So I I I won't. The idea is if I have a dream that's very clear and sharp and not an anxiety dream, I'll tell my wife about it, which is the equivalent of writing it down. So I try very hard never to tell her about a dream that's not going to come true. So as a result, I miss some very good dreams that I could have told her. So that, like when you're forecasting an act, I, in my later life, I was putting lasers on airplanes to look for wind shear. And the algorithm is, it's okay to occasionally forecast a wind shear at where there is no wind shear, but it's very bad to miss a wind shear that it causes a plane to crash. So we can accept a type 2 error, which is neglecting to forecast the future, even when you have it correctly, but uh, you must never call the future with the, you don't call up the future for an event that did not occur. So it's a, the kind of confidence rating. Mm -hmm. And for someone who is maybe new to remote viewing or trying to decide how to uh, improve their methods with it, how would you suggest someone get started or develop their confidence? I would say they find another person to work with and have that person prepare three shopping bags with different objects in it and then mix them up so you don't know which bag you've got and bring it over to your viewer and say, I have an interesting object here. I'm going to show it to you in just a few minutes. Tell me what you're experiencing with regard to this. I'm going to put it in your hand. What surprising image comes to view as you feel this thing and I put it in your hand? Just try to tell me what you're experiencing. And a viewer, an interviewer in that situation is an important part because the guy starts out not knowing what you're talking about, but you've got to convince him. 
I, I, I have an object right here I'm going to put in your hand. What do you experience? And you've got to be confident that that's going to happen. My, my favorite experience like that is a visit I had from Yakin Aranov, who's a very well-known Israeli physicist and the head of our laboratory, uh, Bob Elliott, wanted to have a skeptic come to our lab and see what he would see what our protocol was. And which means to make sure I didn't give him a clue. So I sat down with Iranoff and told him what we we're doing. He said, I don't know, but I, we, we could talk physics. Aranoff and I were both physicists. He said, well, I understand what you want me to do, but when I close my eyes, it's dark. I don't know about you. And we did that for about 20 minutes. And then I said to him, well, they're getting ready to leave their place now. I know it's dark for you. Why don't you just make up something? Pretend you're in therapy. And your, your psychologist said, oh, just free associate. Tell, tell me what kind of image comes into your mind. If even if you just make it up. And he said, well, I see some ducks crossing the road. I said, That's wonderful. Can you draw a duck for me? He said, of course I can draw a duck. So he did that for a while. And then the travelers helped put off my partner. And the lab director came back and said, okay, where were you? Where, where, where were you hiding? He said, well, we were sent to the duck pond in Palo Alto. And I said, well, that's wonderful. Aronoff drew ducks for you. Here they are. So he went back to Israel with a photograph of the duck pond and his drawing of the ducks. And he that's, that's the way we, that was our protocol for any high-level person right up to the Undersecretary of Defense. They all say it's impossible, I don't see anything. And it's the interviewer's job to make him see something. Right, and I like how you said, I have an interesting object. And uh, you also mentioned the word surprise. So it somehow that seems enticing for the person who is viewing. That's right. You're, you're not going to know the object, but you're going to have a surprising experience and my take is that uh, you can't do that wrong because I'm asking you what you experience and only you know what what you're experiencing. And if you describe, if you do a good, good job describing your experience, then you get the right answer. And your, how much do you feel your consciousness is entangled then with the viewer with your positive expectation? It seems like... I think my positive expectation is very important. If you're doing this experiment, see, in, in, in the, book, the little book that I that I published last year called Third Eye Spies, I have a lot of information from Ingo Swan, who's a great psychic. He told a lot of people, taught a lot of people, including government scientists, how to do remote viewing. And he emphasized that the per that the person interviewing has to be very confident that it's going to work, because it communicates to the viewer that this is a ordinary perception. You, that is, you you can do this. There's no doubt um, about it. I think that's one of your great talents, Russell, is the, you, know, you have, when you tell people you can do this, yeah. they believe you. Yeah. And then they believe in themselves as well. That's, yeah. that's the result of growing up as an only child. <laughs> Well, it's uh, for those who are viewing, I see it's seven minutes past the top of the hour, and we're going to continue uh, approximately another 22 minutes or so until we reach the uh, bottom of the hour. And we have a question here from a viewer whose YouTube name is I'll Believe Anything. Mm -hmm. 
uh, who wishes you happy birthday, Russell, and asks, what is the craziest thing you've ever seen in all your years in parapsychology? What an interesting, what an interesting idea. Mm. Well, what, what comes to view is a cylindrical bir birthday cake covered with, covered with whipped cream. And I don't know what that so I'll have to I have to work on that. But that pic but that picture came I did I had a birthday that I did not have a I did not have a whipped cream birthday cake that was cylindrical. I had a rectangular birthday cake that was chocolate. So it wasn't that. So I, I I had a piece what, of it. What Ingo would call you write that if you have an image like that. You just put it right down, uh, AOL, AOL birthday cake as an analytical overlay. We say that's a source of noise. We, we, mm -hmm. don't, we, don't, we don't know what it pertains to. The I, I'm trying to think of. Well, once once we had had a we did a remote viewing, uh, where the hiding place was a large church, and uh, Kit Green forecast that it was a church, and he had some kind of frightening experience when we took him there. That he describes uh, church like things pretty well, and we took him back there. And he had a kind of fri he a frightening religious experience uh, that really changed him when, when he went to that church. He interacted with the minister, took him around the church, and it just scared the hell out of him for some reason. Re re he Kate Green is a very um, high-level analyst of the CIA. He's a physician and a psychologist. So he's not, not a pushover, but he has some kind of shocking religious experience in the church, which scared, which scared him. And he was able to write that down before it occurred. When I think about it, I, it, it dawns on me, Russell, that one of the craziest experiences you probably had is, is the one that led me to end up doing the research on Ted Owens, the PK man, uh, because originally he had reached out to you. That's right. Ted Owens said, I, I was resisting him. This, our experiments at SRI were fragile. We We couldn't have some random person coming to us and let rabbits loose in the hallway because then the, all, all the management would know about it. Hard was doing experiments and the rabbits got loose and the guys don't know what they're doing. So we have to be very careful that, that no weirdness cre creeps out of our laboratory. And Ted Owens was forecasting major changes in the weather and UFOs, all kind, and I, I just spoke to him on the phone, and I said, well, that, that's very interesting, but I think that uh, you're too advanced for us. And he said, well, I can send you some weather. I'm going to send you, here, here we are uh, in April or May, and I'm going to send you a snowstorm to Palo Alto like you've never seen in the spring before. And I said, okay, I'll look for that. And then this was over the weekend. And then on Sunday, we had a rare snowstorm in Palo Alto. And I said the wrong thing to Owen. I said, well, that, that's a fantastic snowstorm. You really predicted that exactly right. And he said, I didn't predict anything. I created that. So that was my snowstorm. So it's like talking to... Uh, the, Donald Trump, who owns whatever it is. So Ted Owens, uh, that's, 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 I created that. But 
But Je Jeffrey then was very convinced by that and went on to do a lot of work and write, write a book about Ted Owens. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, but I, he, 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 mm -hmm. he was too advanced for us at SRI. That I, I, didn't, I was w worried that he would do something or say something or create a problem for us. You were eager to turn the whole file over to me, as I recall. That's right. I, I left my visit to SRI with all of your files on Ted Owens. I think it would be interesting to make a movie about Ted Owens. Yeah. I mean, he was a, he was a real magician. Yeah. Well, may, maybe that will yet happen. We just have about, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> we just have about 15 minutes left. And there's another question here from a viewer named Tyanite One who asks, to you, Russell, you once mentioned you had a cancer scare and used a retrocausal technique affirming you never had cancer in the first place. Would you elaborate as much as humanly possible? And they send you their love. Yeah, as much as you I did I did have a cancer scare. Well, first I, I had cancer in 1985. And I then had cancer surgery. And then about 10 years later or more, uh, I had a similar uh, problem, the, the digestive problem that, that looked like cancer. And they did a, sc did a scan, and it looked like um, I had lumps in my liver. And they said, oh, dear, we're going to have to ask operate and I was working with a healer Jane Catra at that time and she said I don't think that's true I don't think you're actually sick so we delayed our surgery for another week and they did another scan and there were something like lumps in my liver but it was with a a meeting of a bunch of blood vessels that I wasn't actually sick. Yeah. So what they decided is that in retrospect, their first scan was an error, and my friendly healer was able to say, I don't care what the scan said, I don't think you're sick. My, my intuition is you're not sick at all. So we don't know whether she was psychic or whether she healed me, but I was definitely had an x-ray that looked very menacing. I was in the hospital scheduled for surgery and Jane interceded and we had a good outcome. We, 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 I mean, that's, that's the whole story. Uh, but, and so we, we really don't know what part the healer played in that, but her intervention was successful. Here's a question from one of our regular viewers, uh, Suzanne Taylor, who uh, maybe you know. She says, Dear Russell, if you ran the world, what would you do to wake it up? Well, that's a hard question for physicists. I would try and convince people that they were not machines that ate spaghetti and meatballs, but they were uh, divine creatures who were in touch with the larger universe. Try, try and get them, so, try and give them experiences so they realize that they're, that they're not what they see in the mirror. If you think that who you are is what you see in the mirror, uh, then you're going to, have a bad, bad outcome because what you see in the mirror changes and it usually changes for the worse. Hmm. So if you can be in touch with your larger self, your spacious self, then it will change your attitude to, toward the materiality in the, in the, in the world. That the spacious view takes you away from 
the desire to acquire stuff and give you a feeling that you can participate in the not non non local reality. As physicist says, we live in a non-local space-time. That is, you can move your consciousness through space and time and describe what's in the distance and what's in the future. And that, there's no doubt about that. That is, 50 years of research really convinces, and my work and other people's work convinces me that we're, we are basically spacious entities and we're made of materiality, of course, but we have the ability to expand our awareness and interact with people in the distance and in the future. Right, and if you go deeper into the physical world, there isn't much there. That's where we get into what some may refer to as dark matter or an invisible, the invisible world. That's right. There are there are parts of the universe that seem to do something that you can't see. There's dark matter and dark energy. Told us surprisingly that the, that the universe is expanding even be, beyond what was originally measured. The universe is expanding faster and faster. And one of these days you won't be able to see anything out in the future, out in the sky could we'll all be too far away. Here's a question from a viewer named Effie Nema Yaman. Russell, if you weren't retired and you had another 25 or so years and adequate funding and resources, what would you decide would be the most important parapsychological subject to research? Oh, there's no doubt that the most important thing to research is, is how we can see into the future. That is, you're one of the first questions is about free will. Uh, if you offer me chocolate and vanilla, um, and you're very psychic, you can predict what I'm going to choose. And that makes me feel bad because I like to have the idea that I freely choose which one I want. The fact that it's already handled is a little disturbing. And the thing that we know is that a lot of our choices are, are already handled because you see that in the dream. That you couldn't have you couldn't have the sharp dream of what you're going to see unless it was already already handled. So what I would definitely do is uh experience, do experiments pertaining to precognition because uh, that's a major, major unknown. That is, I could say that most remote viewing is caused by precognition because somebody comes to the lab and I say, I'm going to show you something weird. Uh, tell me what that feels like. And then I show it to them. Uh, that's not even surprising because they're going to have the direct experience. As I know why they're having that experience because I'm going to show it to them. I I don't know the answer. I, in our experience, they're always double blind. So as an interviewer, I can say anything I want because they don't know, don't know anything about the target. But um, we get to see something in advance that we're going to experience in the future. And that's very puzzling to scientists who like causality. So if I was just setting up a laboratory, I would do experiments to try and understand uh, how, it, how it is that we can see in the future. So let me put it, put it bluntly. I think that most so-called remote viewing is not quieting your mind and looking at where the guy is hiding. I think it's really quieting your mind and seeing the feedback you're going you're gonna to get. For example, I have a picture on the wall here. One day, Pat Price did not show up for an experiment, and Hal was traveling in South America. And my first remote viewing that I ever did, I drew an island airport. I'm looking at it right now. It's, an air, it's a diagonal picture of, an, of a runway with the airport building on the left, sand and gravel on the right, 
and the ocean at the end of the runway is what I drew. And a couple of weeks later, Hal came back with a picture, photograph taken from an airplane that exactly resembled what I drew. That it, it, It's not approximately correct. It's as though I was sitting in front of the photograph and doing my best to copy the photograph on a piece of paper two weeks before I got to see the paper. So everyone said, that's a fantastic remote viewing. You, you really followed Hal all the way to San Andreas. And recently, as I put, put a lot, you can see that I have a lot of pictures on my wall. Most of these pictures I now think are precognition rather than remote viewing. That is, it doesn't make any sense. That when I had this picture framed, the, the photographer in the studio said, that's what is a remarkable drawing. Where, where was the person standing to, to make that drawing? And the answer is, well, he was about 500 feet up in the air to the left of the airport. That's where the photograph was taken. And my drawing exactly corresponds to where the airplane was at that time. Not, not to where hell was. The photograph was taken later. But of course, the photograph was taken before my drawing. Yeah. I'm going to share my screen so people can actually see the drawings that you're referring to. Here is the uh, drawing that you made. And then here, this is an aerial view of uh, the airport uh, right up against the ocean as you have drawn it. And uh, there's even the um, airport building doesn't show up as well on, on this photo. So... But you can see you can see the runway, the ocean at the end of the runway. Yeah. So that's, that's a kind of mysterious occurrence, but it doesn't make sense for me to have drawn that view if my traveler was on the ground drinking coffee at the airport building. Somehow, somehow I. What what I, what I I'm sort of taking away. The, the goodness of that drawing, say, cause like I currently believe the simplest explanation for that is that I made a drawing of my feedback. Mm -hmm. so, sorry to say. So if I was doing experiments in the few, in the few, few if, if you give me a lot of money to do experiments, I would try and examine how, how it is that we're uh, able to travel through time and see what they're going to give me uh, in a few hours, even though it's not yet chosen. Yeah, time is quite a mystery. We have a question from Celia Funk, who is one of our volunteers. And she asks, if you can please tell us about your experience with A Course in Miracles and how it relates for you to remote viewing. Well, I, I knew Judy Scutch at the very, very beginning when she first started teaching Course in Miracles. She's the publisher of the book. She, she's the publisher uh, of the book. I, I, I'm, I don't want to take a lot of time right now because I'm not. I'm many years away from the Course in Miracles. Um. I would I would have to what of course miracles basically said things things are not the way they seem. That is there's more there's more going on than you ordinarily experience. And of course has a very nice way of inviting you to quiet your mind and experience things the way they really are. And I'm I'm now thirty years away from the Course in Miracles, so I can't remember 
there are tidy, tidy descriptions of inviting you to quite as very as a very Buddhist approach, inviting you to quiet your mind. It's, it's like the Buddha's teachings on emptiness. So I'm just, um, so I'm sorry I can't I can't give you the answer that Course in Miracles deserves because I'm just too too far away from that now, and as you can tell, my memory is also not as good as it might might be. Well, it's fair to say that at one time in your life, the Course in Miracles was an important influence. Yes, that's definitely true. Maybe we'll just leave it at that for now. We have time for maybe one more question. Is that okay if I go ahead and ask another question? So this is from another wonderful volunteer, Laura Newbert, who frequently helps in many ways on New Thinking Aloud and is also a moderator here on the live stream today. And she asks, did Ingo Swan or others ever share their impressions of UAP UFO phenomena with you? Yeah, Ingo Swan and Pat Price both had a rich life involving UFOs. Ingo wrote a book called Penetrations, in which some mysterious people took him up north through Alaska to see a UFO come out of the water and um, fly right over them, scared everybody. And my good friend Richard Dolan, who's a historian, and now become a expert uh, fact finder about UFOs has written a, is just writing a big book entirely about underwater and surfacing UFOs. So Richard Dolan is going to come out with a book uh, very shortly, greatly resembling Ingo's description of what he saw. Um, when he was taken to Alaska. Now I have to put a asterisk there in that I'm not 100% sure that that actually occurred to Ingo or might have been a remote viewing or some other kind of image because Ingo does also write uh, science fiction. So Penetration is a, people are very excited about his book Penetration and it is very exciting as a first-person novel of somebody who was taken by the CIA to see a UFO emerging from the ocean or from a big lake in North. And I am, I am not, I cannot testify to the truth of that. I'm sorry to say. But I'm not saying I'm not saying it's fiction. I'm just saying, uh, in my experience with Ingo. And with psychic phenomena, um, I, I can't tell whether that's Ingo's idea of what would happen or whether it actually did happen. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Russell. And happy birthday one, once again. It's been our great joy to help celebrate your 90th birthday and your long career in, in parapsychology, especially remote viewing, and, and even more especially, your deep interest in uh, timeless awareness and its implications for uh, the larger self of, uh, that we all timeless, share. Timeless awareness was invented by the guy on the wall in my office here, Padmasambhava, was the first person to talk about timeless awareness. He he wrote a book still in print called Self Liberation Through Seeing with Naked Awareness. And he wrote that in the year eight hundred. So he was already giving instruction. This is Padmasambhava, who's the Buddhist teacher who was summoned from India to go to Tibet to help put an end to internecine religious fighting in Tibet. So he's a historical person who did live, and his big contribution is he introduced the way of thinking about timeless awareness. And so he brought Buddhism to Tibet, which is now considered the 
world center of Tibetan Buddhism. And he definitely did that. And he talked about seeing with timeless awareness uh, to quiet your mind and to give up the desire for naming and grasping. Trying to name things and grasp onto the image uh, is the enemy of psychic functioning. And that's exactly what Ingo taught. He taught that analytical overlay that is trying to name and grasp onto the image you have uh, will ca cause you to create errors and introduce um, unnatural birthday cakes into your meditation. Well, it's so, been a so, joy to be with both of you. The point is, remote viewing is not new age. <laughs> Pablis and Baba very well understood what remote viewing was and how to do it and what the interfering elements were. So the deep part of his Buddha's meditation was uh, seeing with me. I mean, his, his whole teaching is about quieting your mind through seeing with naked awareness. Naked awareness, that's a great uh, phrase. Well, thank you all. And uh, just a reminder to our viewers that uh, New Thinking Aloud offers a quarterly magazine, a weekly newsletter, a uh, new book imprint, the uh, New Thinking Aloud Dialogues imprint. Uh, you can learn more about all of these things at the website of the New Thinking Aloud Foundation, which is New Thinking Aloud, all one word, and it allowed is a l l o w e d dot o r g. Uh, that'll take you to the foundation. So uh, we'll end our live stream now, and uh, we look forward to uh, reading your comments on the archival copy of this live stream event, which will be going up shortly. And thank you well, thank all. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to tell tell all these folks about remote viewing, what the nature of their consciousness is and what's available to them. Yes. And many blessed, more blessed years to you, Russell, with health and love. And thank you all to the viewers for being with us today because